shot. Yeah. I was sitting in front of one thing. Yeah. But this correspondence thing is not working. Can you enjoy it? What? Because you're winning right now. That's yeah. why you enjoy it. Uh, Try losing a bunch in a row. Then you won't enjoy it as much. I'm going to take a new position. So I'm scrolling on my head. Yeah. I just look at the board. Yeah, but it's because your hair looks totally different. All right, when do we get started? So, um,. Okay, let's get started. So we uh, we finished last time talking about the Dane Somerville relations, and these were some uh, linear relations between the phase numbers of a polytope. And the phase numbers are the number of faces of each dimension. But this was for simplicial polytopes. So, um, so let 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 that, let P be a simplicial polytope. Um, remember, simplicial means that every proper face is a simplex. We had the, the running example of the tetrahedron. Sorry, the octahedron. So the octahedron is an example where it itself is not a simplex, but all of its proper faces are simplices. Okay. Um, and so let's so f i is the number of uh, i dimensional faces of p. And so this was the f vector. So we talked about how in this case the f vector is uh, we have the empty set, then we have the six points, the twelve edges, and the eight triangles. And for for a reason that you will see in a moment, we like to count the empty face here, and we don't like to count the full face here. Okay, and then we have the h vector, and uh, so we said this is some some transformation of the f, f vector, and it's given by the following relation: that the sum from i equals zero to d of f i minus one, x minus one to the d minus i, is equal to so remember, we, we just take this thing and we make a polynomial of it in the variable x cubed, x minus 1 cubed. Okay? And then we take that, we just multiply it out and see what we get. In this case, we get x cubed plus 3x squared plus 3x plus 1, and we call these numbers the h numbers, so the h vector. So this is uh, H0, H1, H2, H3. And so the theorem of Dane and Somerville is that, as we see in this example, uh, this H sequence is symmetric. HI is equal to HD minus I. Are all I? And furthermore, any th these are these are all the relations between the f numbers. Okay, so any linear relation between the phase.
various numbers of all centripetal polytopes. is a linear combination of these. Okay. So this is the theorem of Dane and Summer. Um, before, so I want to start by proving at least that these relations do hold. Okay. But before I do that, I want to show you a very nice trick for computing the H vector without having to do all of this. Okay. So there's something called Stanley's trick for computing um, the H vector given the F vector. So what we do is that we make a little, kind of like a Pascal's triangle, except on the right diagonal we put the F vector on the left diagonal, we put ones. Okay. So this is the F vector. And so Stanley tells us to do the following. Uh, we're going to do like the Pascal triangle, but with a minus sign. So each time, we're going to take the number over here minus the number over here. So 6 minus 1 is 5. 12 minus 5 is 7. 5 minus 1 is 4. Okay. 8 minus 7, I missed one, 1. 8 minus 7 is 1. 7 minus 4 is 3. 4 minus 1 is 3. And then 1. So, no matter what f vector you start with, this procedure gives you the h vector. Okay. In other words, the, this this numerical coincidence here is exactly uh, equivalent to this defining relation. That's a nice exercise to prove that this is equivalent to this. Um, okay, so. Again, I'm, I'm about to prove this, but before, let's talk about this, this one right here, okay? So we're saying that any linear relation that holds between phase numbers of centripetal polytopes has to be a consequence of these, okay? For example, when the dimension is three, we only have two dane summer relations. H0 equals H3, and H1 equals H2. Now, Let's think about it. Do we know other relations between the phase numbers of a simplicial three polytope? Is there a linear equation satisfied by the phase numbers? Um, actually, there is one. It's actually satisfied by for any polytope, and that is that the vertices minus the edges plus the faces is two. And so somehow, that has to be a consequence of this. So let me show you how that's a consequence of this. We're happy with this. Now let's do the same thing, but for an arbitrary polytope. So in general, I have um, the vertices here, the edges here, and the faces here. So then I go v minus 1, and then v minus 1 minus 1 is v minus 2, e minus B minus 1 is this. Okay. B minus 2 minus 1 is B minus 3. This minus this, I get E minus 2B plus 3. Okay. And this minus this, I get F minus E plus B minus 1. This minus this. So this is the H vector of an arbitrary polytope, and so we see that uh, Euler's relation that faces minus edges plus vertices is equal to 2 is exactly equivalent to the first Dane-Summer relation. So the fact that H0 is equal to H, what is it, D minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3 HD, 
This is Euler's relation. Okay. And actually, you can see that this is true in, in any dimension, not just in dimension three. So this is one way of thinking about the Dane Summerby relations. The, the first one holds for any polytope. It's Euler's relation. The other ones don't hold for any polytope. They only hold for simplicial polytopes. Okay, so you've never heard of a relation for polytopes that says that e minus 2 e plus 3 equals b minus 3. That's because that doesn't hold in general. But if your polytope happens to be simplicial, if it's made of triangles, then this is also equal to this. And that's what this is saying. Okay, so let's let's prove there's two statements, and I don't really have time to prove the second one, but at least we're going to prove the first one. Um, so again, I'm going to go to the incidence algebra. So the incidence algebra, remember that. The incidence algebra contains the element zeta, which is always 1. And mu, which is the inverse of zeta in the incidence algebra. Of the lattice of faces of the part. Okay? And let me also remind you what happens when you take uh, zeta to the n of going from the top element to, from the bottom to the top element. Okay, so remember that this is a convolution. And so when we do this, we're supposed to take the sum over all 0 less than or equal to t. Let's see, how far do I go? t1 up to t. Less than or equal to one. Okay, so T n minus one. Right. Because the convolution tells me to go from zero to T one, from T one to T two, etc., up to T n minus one to T n, which is one. Okay. And this is the nth power, so I'm supposed to do zeta of zero T one. Zeta of t1, t2, dot, 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 up to zeta of tn minus 1, 1. Right? That's, that's the definition of the nth power of zeta in the incidence algebra. Okay? But again, this is a mess, and it's completely unnecessary because these are all 1s. Right? So let's just erase this garbage and just put 1. Okay? That's the definition, but this is equal to the sum of ones, okay? And so really, I'm just looking at the number of ways of doing this, and these are the, the multi-chains. So number of multi-chains of length n from zero to one. Okay? And I'll remind you that this we gave a name to, we call this the zeta polynomial. We show there's a polynomial in it. Okay. Excuse me. Oh, length. N from 0 to 1. And so this is the zeta polynomial. Now, what happens when I plug in a negative integer? What I'm going to get is zeta to the minus n. But mu is the inverse of zeta. And so really what I get here is just the nth convolution of the Mobius function. Okay. 
And so this is sum over the same set of a bunch of Mobius things. Mobius from 0 to T1, Mobius from T1 to T2, up to Mobius from Tn minus 1 to 1. And I think it's illustrative actually to, so imagine that this is the lattice of the poset, this is the lattice of the polytope, right? so this is the empty phase, this is the top uh, phase, the full dimensional phase. And so here, what we're counting is just a number of ways of going from here, then you go to some phase, then you go to some other phase that contains this one, then maybe you stall there for a little bit, maybe you stall again, and then you jump on to another phase, and you keep going like that until you get here. Okay, multi chains. And so, really, you can think of, of, of that as you know, if you start from the empty phase, then maybe you hop to a point, then to a segment that contains the point, and, and so on. Okay. That's what this is counting. Now, here, what we're doing is now summing over the same things, but we're taking these Mobius numbers here. But the, the nice thing about this is that actually we know the Mobius function of this lattice. We proved that this is just once and minus once. Right? And so this is just sum of a bunch of minus ones. How many minus ones? Well, this gives me minus one to the length from zero to T1. This gives me minus 1 to the length from t1 to t2, etc., up until minus 1 to the length of tn minus 1 to 1. Right? It's just minus 1 to the height. So what happens when I multiply minus 1 to this height, minus 1 to this height, minus 1 to this height, this height, this height? What I get is minus 1 to the whole height of the from 0 to 1. Okay. So this product of minus 1s is actually just minus 1 to the height of the poset. Right? So let me uh, erase this, put the minus 1 to the height of the poset outside, and I just get a sum of 1s. Okay? And so what I get is that this is minus 1 to the n times this was this the zeta polynomial. Okay? So it's, just, it's a very strange uh, things. The zeta polynomial of L at minus n equals the zeta polynomial of L at n, except for a sign. Okay. Some kind of combinatorial reciprocity that's extremely simple. Yeah? So, what about uh, the height of the lattice for the flat, or the lattice of faces for a polytope n or n plus 1? I, <coughs> uh, actually, I realize that I have. And also n, yeah. I want to distinguish n and d here. So I was using n for this, but here I actually meant the height of the poset, which is not n. The height of the poset. Oh no, sorry. For here n. Yeah, this is not, this is fine. N n n. The the height of the poset came up here. Right. I went minus one from zero to one. And uh, so that height is not n. That height is d. Is the, the dimension of the polytope to go from the empty phase to the to the full dimension. Okay, now that that looks a lot better, and it basically says that if d is even, then the zeta polynomial is an even polynomial, and if d is odd, then the zeta polynomial is an odd polynomial. That's all it says. So let's put that over here. Here's our first observation. Zeta polynomial has this kind of reciprocity property. Okay.
Okay. Now, let me consider what happens if I truncate, if I just remove the top element. The blue post head is L minus the top element. And the black post head is L. So what I want to show now is the following. How can I relate the zeta polynomial of L and the zeta polynomial of L minus the top element? They count kind of the same thing. Right? We're counting multi-chains. The only difference is that in L you're allowed to use the top element, and in L minus 1 you're not. Okay. So if I want a chain from 0 to uh, 1 in L, um, the the point is basically this. What is, what is a chain from 0 to 1? A chain from 0 to 1 is basically, <coughs> it's basically saying walk from 0 to somewhere and then go to 1 some number of times. Okay? And the thing is that if you, if you take a... a If you take a, a multi-chain in L minus 1 that takes n steps, you can always complete it to 1 of L by just then going to the top and just repeating the top element n minus n times. Repeat 1 n minus n times. Okay. So let me say that again. If you take a, if you take a, a walk of length m, in the blue lattice, then you can turn it into a walk from 0 to 1 in the black lattice by just going to 1, 1, 1, 1 until you, until you get to n steps. Okay. And conversely, if you have a step in the black lattice that takes n steps, then just remove all the occurrences of 1 and you get a, a walk in the blue lattice of length m. And so what you get is this. And so what this says, now let's do zeta of L minus 1. So this is the sum, and I'm equal 0. The same thing, but with L minus 1. Okay. So now if I subtract zeta of Ln minus zeta of L comma N minus 1, this minus this is... You know, this sum is the same as this one, except for it has one extra term. And so I get this relation between them. Okay. And so this tells me that counting walks in L or in L minus 1 is more or less the same thing. Okay, now... You might be wondering why. <laughs> you might be wondering what the hell I'm doing, basically, because I, you know, we're we're headed for these H's and these F's, and I, and they haven't come up yet. But uh, what I want to show you is that actually the F, the F's come very naturally in this zeta form. So let's do that now. So I recorded these two relations, and now let's record a third relation that is very important. So now we're just going to count things in L minus 1. Okay. So So here's the thing. Um, let's say that we take a multi-chain of size n in L minus 1. Okay? And uh, 
I don't know, maybe. Maybe it looks like this. And so what we want to do is that we, we want to figure out um, let's see what, is, what exactly do I want to say here? Let, let's look at what the last the last phase was here. Um, take a walk like this, and let's suppose that, that uh, it ended at S. Okay. So then I say the following thing. I say, how many ways are there to take this walk that ends at F? So it's going to be sum over all the faces in my poset of Now, taking a walk from, if f is going to be the last element of my multi-chain, then the other ones have to be in the interval 0f, right? Okay. And um, now the, the, the last step of this walk is prescribed. <coughs> it's prescribed. The, the last step of the walk has to go to f. But the other ones, we don't know what they are. Okay? And so what I have left is a walk in the green interval that takes one fewer step. So in the green interval, I take m minus 1 steps. And then in the last step, I'm forced to go to f. Now, here is where we're finally going to use that our polytope is simplicial. We haven't used it yet. Um, the thing is that if f is a proper phase, then we know what this is. This is just the phase poset of a simplex. So, well, this is the, the phase poset of a simplex. Dimension uh, whatever the dimension of F is. Okay. Now what is what is the lattice of faces of a simplex? We talked about this last time, and I mentioned that it's and it's pretty easy to check that the lattice of faces of a simplex is actually uh, just a Boolean poset. So this is just a Boolean poset of uh, size, I think it's actually the, the dimension, of f plus 1. Yeah? Sorry, the top line, I'm still, yeah, I'm still working on this one. Like, why is there no double counting or anything? It's not clear to me from the picture. So going back to the top line, I'm, I'm saying I'm counting all the walks of length n in my blue poset. And what I do is that I divide them according to who the last element of the walk is. And if the last, if the last element of the walk is f, I fix it. And then the rest of the walk is, is, has this many possibilities. And f is unique to each walk. So that's why I have this. But then the point is that this is a, this is a simplex, and so I just get that this green thing is uh, it's just a Boolean poset of size dimension of f plus one. Yeah. So for example, if if you look at the face poset of a triangle, if you draw it, you're going to find that it's the cube. So for two dimensions, you get the, the third Boolean poset. Yeah. Maybe you mentioned this, but like, what if the walk is of length n? Keeps repeating there. So then from, from 0 to f, for the, the length n minus 1. 
The thing is that, I mean, we're saying that the last step goes to F. Now, the next to last step actually might be here already. It might be that you repeat there. That's okay. That's, that's accounted for. Um, so, so what do I have here? I have now the zeta polynomial of the Boolean poset. And that's actually the, just the, the easiest zeta polynomial. You have a cube, and you're trying to figure out how many ways are there to go from the bottom of the cube to the top of the cube in n minus 1 steps. That's a nice exercise. Actually, I forget if we did it in class or not, but it's a pretty simple exercise. I don't mean that it's immediate, but uh, it's not too hard to see that this is exactly the zeta polynomial of, of the d boolean poset is just n minus one two. Sorry, the zeta polynomial of the d uh, boolean lattice is just n to the d. That's a, a nice exercise. So that gives me this. Okay. But you see what I get here now is that what is the coefficient of n minus 1 to the i? It's going to be the number of faces of dimension n minus 1. So you see this is this is basically the f ball number. So that's why that's why I do this count because I get this the phase numbers like this. Okay. Um, so maybe that's another one we're recording here. Zeta polynomial of L minus 1 to the n is the sum from i equals 0 to d of f i minus 1 n minus 1 to the n. And uh, I claim that this is basically it. Because then we're going to do the following thing. We're going to say that We just put these things together. Sum from i equals 0 to d of a min i minus 1 and minus 1 to the i. That's zeta of l minus 1 comma n, right? Zeta of l minus 1 comma n. Okay, but we know that this is zeta of l n minus zeta of l n minus 1. Okay? Now I'm going to apply reciprocity. So I get minus 1 to the d times z of l minus n minus z of l minus n plus 1. Right? And then I'm going to say um, What am I going to say? I'm going to now uh, let me let me add a minus sign here and introduce it in here. So instead of plus minus, I get minus plus. <coughs> okay. And the reason for doing that is that now I have zeta of no, something plus one minus zeta of something which means that I can apply the second relation again. I apply the second relation where now, instead of n, I have minus n plus 1. This minus this. And then, now I apply the last relation again. 
And I get that this is sum to my equals zero to d of fi minus one times, now I get, there I have n minus one to the i, so I guess here I should put minus n to the i. Okay. So I get this. So I don't know, it's some kind of formal computation. All I'm doing is putting these things together. But what you should realize is that I took some something, I took a polynomial in the f's, and I proved that it was equal to another polynomial in the f's, different polynomials. Okay. And uh, right, so this is this is what I proved. And then it's just a, a, a kind of tedious but simple computation to show that this is actually the same as what we want. Each i is equal to h t minus i. So I mean, you look at this and you and you agree that this gives relations between the fi's. And then I'm, I'm asking for your trust at the moment that these relations are equivalent to the dense summary relations, but you just have to trust me until after class. So after class, you should look at the notes and you see it's it's like a three-line computation. It's kind of boring, but it's it's there, and it shows that this is equivalent to the dense summary relations. Okay. And so this proves this proves this part. Okay. Are there any questions about about what we did so far? Does that come up often where you have two expressions? <coughs> you have two different like bases basically, right? And that gives you a relation on the coefficients in terms of these different bases. Does that come up often or no? I see. So you're, so you're thinking of two different bases for the polynomial ring. One is x minus 1 to the i. The other one is minus x to the i. And we're showing that the same, we're showing that there's an element whose expression in this basis and in this basis are basically the same. Um, no, I would say it's pretty rare, because it's rare to have such theorems as beautiful as this one. Um, actually, I, I forgot that I, I wanted to show you something else about why this theorem is um, so surprising. So let's do this again. So let's go back to thinking about here's the n vector, and then the h vector is going to land here. So let me let me make it very explicit why what the dense number relations say here and why this is so remarkable and rare. Let's say that you, know, you look at this polytope, you see a simplicial, right? All the faces are triangles, and it's not too hard to count the points, six points. Okay. So I claim that this number six determines the whole effect. In other words, if you have a, a simplicial polytope and it has a simplicial three polytope and it has six vertices, then you know the f vector. And not only for six, for any number of vertices. If you know the number of vertices of a simplicial polytope, you know everything else. Why is that? Because you say, okay, well, if this is six, then six minus one is five, five minus one is four, four minus one is three. Okay, so this entry of the h vector is three, but the h vector is symmetric. Which means that you can kind of backtrack this now and say, okay, well, if this is one and three, that means that I should have a three and a one here, right? So I need something here so that this minus this is three. I need something here so that this minus this is seven. And I need something here so that this minus this is one. So the whole net vector is determined by a single number, the number of vertices. 
I think that's pretty amazing. Uh, and in general, if you're in, in d dimensions, then this guy has length d or d plus 1 or something like that. But the point is that, that if you know only the first half, then you can take it over here and then take it back and figure out what the second half is. So the f vector is determined by only half of its entries, which is very rare. OK, so that's the Dane-Somerville. Those are the Dane-Somerville relations. Um, now, let me say a couple more things about it. So this theorem tells you what are, okay, so this, this theorem characterizes all the linear equalities among f vectors of simplicial polytopes. Um, but, you know, mathematicians are ambitious, and whenever, as soon as we prove something, we go for something harder, right? We, we never seem to be able to stay still and be happy with the theorem. We always look for, okay, well, if I know that, what do I not know? So, if I know the linear equations among these, what about the inequalities between them? Are there inequalities that any f vector has to satisfy? Or a much bolder question to ask is, can I characterize all f vectors of simplicial polytopes? Can I characterize all f vectors of simplicial polytopes? In other words, if I give you a, a list of numbers, does there exist a polynomial that has that many vertices, that many edges, that many so forth? I don't know about you guys, but to me this sounds like a spectacularly difficult question. Um, and this maybe gives you some hope that you have some handle on it. Okay, if you can at least say what are the linear equalities. Um, but it, it turns out I think this is one of the most remarkable theorems in combinatorics, that we do have a full answer to this. So the answer is given by a theorem called the G-theorem. It's a good name. <laughs> uh, the G-theorem. So this was conjectured by McMullen in 70. So he said, okay, you know, these are, I think these are all the I think these are the relations that hold, and sorry, I, he basically said, I think that if you're an f vector of a polytope, then you satisfy these conditions, and vice versa. But he actually didn't prove either direction. He didn't prove that polytopes satisfy the conditions, and he didn't prove that if you had a vector like that, you could find a polytope. He just had a really good insight and thought, I, I think this is this is the description. Okay, and. Um, in a paper by Villera and Lee, Lou Villera and Carl, Carl Lee, I think this was in 79, they basically, they proved one direction. So they showed that if you, you had a vector, if McMullen gave them one of his vectors, then they could find a polytope that had that F vector. Is it for any kind of polytope or simplicial? A simplicial polytope, yeah. And uh, and in the same year, Victor Stanley completed this by showing the other direction. In other words, showing that that uh, any simplicial polytope really did satisfy the relations that McMullen, the conditions that McMullen predicted. It's one of the I think one of the most beautiful episodes in combinatorics so far. It's very interesting, and I really encourage you to to look into this. It's really a, a lovely story. Um, Okay, now, I don't know if, 
you're thinking the question that I think you're thinking, Matt. When you ask simplicial, well, you might ask, okay, well, you know, if we're mathematicians and we like to keep asking questions when we know the answer to something. I think the next question is, why did I put simplicial here? Who cares about simplicial? I mean, if I take a polytope, uh, is it simplicial or not? Um, now, remember, sim simplicial means that every uh, every face, every proper face is a simplex. Now, there's another in interesting important family, which is the family of simple polytopes. And those are the polytopes such that every vertex is on exactly D facets. Okay. You can imagine in, in three dimensions, a vertex has to be in at least three faces. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a vertex. So it's simple if every point is in exactly three faces. Okay. And, uh, and simple is that condition in any dimension. I could ask this for simple polytopes, and actually, it turns out that these are the same question because a polytope is simplicial if and only if its polar polytope is simple. This is not hard, actually. And because the f vector of the simplicial polytope is the vector of the simple polytope backwards, then if, if we know the answer to this, then we know the answer to this. So that, ends, that says, OK, well, you know, it's not any harder to do it for simple polytopes. But the question is, what about all polytopes? Why, why not that? Why, what about characterizing all f vectors of all polytopes? And the reason that, uh, okay, so if, we, if we forget about the simplicial condition, this is just beyond us at the moment. This is really wide open. In dimension three, it's known. In dimension three, we have a full characterization of the f vectors of three polytopes. And there's been a lot of effort even to do it in dimension four. And uh, Gunther Ziegler is, is one of the leaders in that project of um, figuring out the f vectors of all four dimensional polytopes. And, and this project is, you know, it has had a lot of success. It has a lot of nice results. But it has come to highlight just how hard this question is. It's really a, a very hard question. And so it's kind of the, the opposite thing, the opposite thing that in mathematics, whenever we have a problem that is just far too hard, then we just focus on something that is a little bit easier, but still interesting. So that's why people focus on this. Um, now this is, this is not such an arbitrary condition, because if you just dro drop some points at random um, in, in uh, Rn, you're going to get a simple polytope, actually, because you, you know, it takes coincidences to, to not be simple. Okay? And so how the, the set of non-simple polytopes has measure zero among all polytopes in whatever reasonable measure you, you choose. So this really includes most polytopes, but, but still it's interesting to do it for all polytopes. Do okay. Do we have the dual event? Like you drop random hyperplanes, then it gives you simplicial? Yeah, if you, yeah, so I should say, if you, drop random, if you drop a set of random points, then you're going to get something that is simple and simplicial. Because, I mean, it, it takes a coincidence to be coplanar, right? If, if, for example, the, the square pyramid, it's not simplicial, right? Because it has this square face. But how likely is it that if you choose four points, they're going to be on the same plane? And that probability is zero. Right? So this, this stuff, it can happen, but this probability is zero. So a random polytope is going to be simple and simple. OK. Um, well, so maybe this is too hard. But we're going to try to do something more flag f vectors. So, so what this is going to be about is that we're not going to care only about how many faces I have in each dimension, but also their incidences. How many points are in how many lines, for example. Okay. 
And so let me define the flag and vector. P is the following thing. So we're going to count the number of sequences. A sequence is called a flag. I'll tell you why in a second. So you take a, a phase one inside a phase two inside inside a phase k of dimensions d1 to d2 up to dk. Okay, and this is going to be f of the set d1. So you're going to say how many points are there, are there in a line, how many points are there in a triangle, how many lines are there, and so on. So why don't we do it for this guy? Let's compute the f vector of the flag f vector of the octahedron. So. boring ones. If you only have one thing in your set, then just get 6, 12, and this means I have 6 phases of dimension, actually I have 6 phases of dimension 0, I have 12 phases of dimension 1, and I have 8 phases of dimension 2. Empty chains, we just say that's 1 by convention. Now, for example, what is f of 0, 1? So f of 0, 1 is the, is the sequences of a point inside a line. So how many ways are there of doing that? Well, the point has six possibilities, and each point is on four segments. So I get 24. By the way, you could have done it backwards. You could have said there's 12 edges, and each edge has two points. 12 times 2 is 24. What about f of 0, 2? So I, have, I want a point inside a two-dimensional face. So again, there are six points. And how many uh, faces contain each point? Four. So I get 24. What about f of 1, 2? I need an edge inside a triangle. So how many edges do I have? 12. And they are in two triangles, either that triangle or that triangle. I get 24. And if I have 1, 2, 3, is taking a point inside a segment inside a triangle. So the point, I have six choices. For the edge, I have four choices. And once I choose my point on my edge, I choose either the triangle here or the triangle there. And you're not going to believe this, but this is why these are called flags, because they, <laughs> they look like flags. It's kind of cheesy, but anyway. And so what can I say about the flag f vectors of all polytopes? Now, you might say, well, that's a lot more ambitious than before, actually. We can't even know what the f vector is. Why do we go for this much harder problem of, of classifying the whole thing? Yeah? Is the last one f012? Oh, yeah. Thank you. f of 0, 1, 2. OK. Um, so. So we encode the flag f vector in a non-commutative, or I should say a polynomial. Yeah. What exactly is the f vector? Is it a number? The the f vector is. This sequence, 1, 6, 12, 8. So, uh, and yeah, the so flag f vector is the whole sequence of all these numbers. 
Oh, so and we didn't even. Oh, so I, so I should have said this is a sequence for all d1 up to dk. So it's all those numbers. So we're going to encode it in a polynomial in non-commutative variables a and b. And uh, instead of trying to define this in any formal way, I think it's easier if I just do a, an example. So what is x of the tetrahedron? What I do is that I just use these as coefficients and then the letters as, as indicators. So for example, I say, OK, 1, a, 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 plus 6, b, a, a. So b means you're in the set. a means you're not in the set. So 12 and then a, b, a, because 1 is in the set and 0 and 2 are not. 8, a, a, b. 24, this is BBA, 24, BAB, 24, ABB, and 48, BB. Is it clear what I did there? So, okay, you know, it's, it's an equivalent thing. Who knows why I'm doing this, but, but uh, clearly this information is the same as this information. It's very important that A and B don't commute. Um, now, the, the reason that I do this is that just like the f vector of simplicial polytopes, the, there's, there's relations in there, and they're kind of hidden, and it's clearer to see them in the, in the h vector. Here, there's also a lot of relations that are hidden. And uh, it's going to turn out that these relations come out when I do the following change of variables. So I'm going to define a new polynomial, psi, and it's going to be equal to this, evaluated at a minus b common. So you're supposed to plug in plug in a minus b comma b. Be careful because a and b don't commute. Multiply that out, and you're gonna get this. You're gonna get one a a a plus five b a a. Plus 11 a b a 7 a a b plus 7 b b a plus 11 b a b plus 5 a b b plus 1 I, I did it, and I, I got this. You're not supposed to kind of see it right away. <coughs> okay, and, and so this thing is called the AB index. Of port. Okay? And in analogy, the coefficients are going to be called the flag H vector. I think you agree that this already reveals some symmetry that we weren't seeing here. If you see that this thing, at least in the order that I wrote it, is symmetric. So, are there relations among? Oh, maybe. We, so, if you want to stare at this thing and, and look at for all the relations, and while you do that, I'm going to tell you a uh, fact 
that instead of doing this weird transformation, I could have done this differently. But I could have defined h of s to be the sum over the subsets of s minus 1 to the s minus t. Okay. So I claim that these h numbers are obtained from these f numbers by this relation. And so I hope you have the instinct to do what is inversion here, or inclusion exclusion. <clears throat> this is for all this. So I don't know, for example, this 12, or maybe this 24. I look at the subsets of B, A, B. Remember, B is that you're in the set, A is that you're not in the set. So the subsets of B, A, B are B, A, B, A, A, B, B, A, 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 A. So what I'm saying is that 24 is equal to 1 plus 5 plus 7 plus 11. This is this relation, and then this is the inversion. So again, this is not a hard exercise to, to show that these relations are equivalent to this change of variables where I plug in A minus B. So, so here I can ask myself a question. Are there relations? Among. And there's probably one relation that Actually, there's probably four relations that you can guess already. Right? The 1 is the 1, the 5 is the 5, the 7 is the 7, the 11 is the 11. So how can we say that? Complement. H of S is equal to H of the complement. So for example, we have this relation. Now, at least in the way that I define this, this is completely not obvious. What we, what we did to get, to get here is completely not symmetric in A and B. And yet we're saying that, the, that here, if I, rebuild the, if I reverse A and B, I get the same thing. So why is it that, if I, that this thing is symmetric in A and B? If I reverse A and B, I get the same polynomial. And are these all the relations? So how many relations are these? This, this guy has two to the n entries, right? Two to the d entries, I guess. So this gives me two to the d minus one relations. Among two to the d things. So it's like before, right? Where to know the full flag f vector, you just need to know half of it. So is that it, or can we hope for more? Mm. Let me keep this here. Um, let's, let's just here. This is a, a theorem due to Marge, Bayer, and Lubilera. And it says the following. It says for every polytope, there exists a polynomial. in non-commutable variables C and D such that the C 
CD, sorry, the AD index of my polytube is equal to the CD index. So this guy is called the CD index, evaluated at A plus B, comma, AB plus B. This guy is called the <coughs> CD index. Okay. So let's try to understand what that means in this example. So this is my my AB index. I don't need this anymore. And so. What this is saying is that I should be able to find a polynomial in these things, which is equal to this. Okay? Now, what kinds of terms can you have in a polynomial with these guys of degree 3? Well, for example, you could have this is of degree 3. The result should be of degree 3, and so I need expressions like this of degree 3. This is of degree 3. And this is of degree 3. But if you notice, there's nothing else of degree 3. Right? These are all the possibilities. And so there must be coefficients that I can put here so that this is equal to this. Okay. So can we figure out what they are? For example, how can I get an AAA? This one, AAA, only comes from the first term. There's no AA here or here. So this must be a one. Where else should I look? And both here. How can I get an AAB? And AAB comes from AAB. It comes from AAB. And it cannot come from here. There's no way of making an AAB with this guy. So if I want 7 and I already have 1, I need 6. Okay. And then what about this? We should go to. What's a good one to go to? Yeah. Which one? A B A. B A B. There's there's several possibilities, but B A A. Somebody said B A A, and that's a good possibility. Because how can I get a B A A? B A A. That's one. Here I cannot get a B A A. And here B A A. So if I want to get five, then this must be a four. Okay. And so this theorem says that. If I get these three coefficients right, everything else is correct. In other words, what this is saying is that if I know this one, this five, and this seven, then I know the whole tag effect. So out of all the eight numbers, I only need three of them to know what the tag effect is. So corollary. To know the two to the n entries in the flag and vector, I only need some subset. Okay. Now we don't we don't know what but it is in general, but we know that if this is 8, then this is 3. And actually, if this 3, 1 is trivial, because this is always 1. So this, this is always a 1. So really, there's only 2 that you, that you need to know. Might as well just put Oh, you need to know the other one. It's just that it's always a 1. Um, now, the other thing that they show 
which I think is also very remarkable, is that these are all the relations. There's no others. So no other relations. Okay? And so what that means is that it's not enough to know two of the numbers. You really need to know three of them. How do they show that? They need to construct a lot of polytopes. Uh, they need to construct enough, enough polytopes that they build up polytopes where no other relation can hold. And it's, it's a matter of linear algebra. You're saying there's a certain number of linear relations. If you want to know that there's no more linear relations, then you need to show that the other things are a basis, and so you just need to build a lot of polytopes that have a lot of f vectors that are linearly independent, except for those relations. So it's a, you know, it's really a construction of lots of polytopes. Yeah. That's right. So, and actually, that's a good question that I don't know the answer to. Which three can you choose here? You shouldn't choose one, five, and five because these two are always equal to each other. So that's you, know, you shouldn't do that. But I think as long as you choose three that are not equal to each other, at least in this example, it works out. But it's a good question. If I give you for it, for some value of n, which subsets determine the rest? I like that question, and I, I don't know the answer. Um, now, here's a question. What if, okay, so for 8, I need to know 3 of them. What about for 2 to the n? What if, where is this 3 coming from? This 3 is coming from the fact that I have these, these three things. These are the three monomials of degree 3 in a plus b and a b plus b a. And these three correspond to This tiling this tiling this tiling okay. where this represents a plus b it has degree one and this represents a b So, if you're trying to get something, if you're trying to get a monomial in these things, and that monomial has degree n, what you're doing is laying down tiles. You lay down this tile, then these two tiles, and, and you need to lay them down in such a way that the total length is n. Right? And so, in the situation that I have of degree n, if I want to know the two to the n entries, how many are enough to determine the rest? Well, however many tilings are there of a two by n rectangle in, uh, in two dominoes. Right? You can you can use it somewhere and get to figure out which three come in one angle. Uh, yeah. I don't really know. But this kind of wraps us up to the beginning of the class. So this is this is the first thing that we did in this class, and we saw that the number of these tilings is exactly. Fibonacci number. Okay? And so this is approximately 1.61 to the end. Yeah? Is this the flag H vector? This is the this is the flag H vector, uh -huh. but uh, if I know the flag F vector, I know the H vector and vice versa. So knowing one or the other is the same thing. So this, and no fewer. Um, and you see, so how, how different is it from the other situation? For the, for the other situation, if you wanted to know that the vector of length n, we needed to know half of the vector. So what fraction? of 2 to the n is 1.61 to the n. It's actually negligible. Because the limit of this divided by this is 0. 
Pick n equals 10. Let's say you're in 10 dimensions. 2 to the 10 is about 1,000. 1 1.6 to the 10, I guarantee you, is less than 100. If you pick n to be 20, this is going to be about a million, and this is probably about, I don't know, 1,000, 2,000. So really, as, as n gets bigger and bigger, you, you need to know fewer and fewer entries of the flag f vector to, to determine the whole f vector. So there's all this amazing structure hidden just inside the incidences of a, of a polytope. Is there, is there any, like, since you know these relations, Um, yeah, so actually, Bayer and Bilera discovered this not quite in this form. I mean, this gives you some complicated relations between the f numbers, and you know, they give you some big complicated expressions. And uh, I'm blanking at the moment on who it was that noticed that the relations that Bayer and Bilera discovered actually can be put in this form. So this can be written in terms of the f vector, but somehow you some other point is you don't want to. It's too ugly. And, and this, first of all, it's a lot cleaner. And second of all, it, if you're going to look for natural explanation, then it's, it's uh, just much better to use a language where the thing looks cleaner. That's a better place to look for a good explanation. It was just because earlier you, you said you wanted to find characteristics for the f vectors and alpha. So to go back to this question, yeah, what is the answer to this question? Like, hell no, I mean, if we can't even characterize the, the f vectors, how do we expect to characterize the flag f vectors? Uh, yeah. Right? We can't even figure out what these four numbers are, or what these n numbers are. How do, you, how do we expect to know the 2 to the n? No, it's, 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 it's hopeless at the moment. Uh, but at least by expanding the problem, we discovered all this new structure that, that was invisible in the single flag f vector. But in, in the single f vector, it was invisible. Here is visible, but I think it points to how this is just a, you know, a massive and massively open area of questions that are extremely interesting. So, so yeah, now that we're back at, at these little pictures, then I think we can stop. So thank you guys. It's been it's been a lot of fun teaching you guys, and I hope that you get excited. This is really just the the beginning, as you see. We just we just got to scratch the surface on on some of the. Nice things in enumerative combinatorics and its applications, and I hope that you'll that you'll keep digging deeper. Okay. So thank you guys. So then someone go becomes easily from this.